there were some suggestions made that there are some concerns raised um, by the persons at the meeting that there are some misunderstandings around, you know, the deployment of DPA um, oh. compliance and whether what we this what is described as the, the grace period that the minister gave whether that impacts us in any positive way or negatively if we if we don't move towards um data com data compliance data protection compliance and so out of that um meeting that chapter meeting a decision was taken that we should sort of not just sit by and allow things to to float but actively seek to get some clarifications and so this afternoon um as you'd have seen in the invitation that was sent out by the JHTA um, office, we we went out to find what we what I believe is perhaps the best person to kind of give us that sort of next level clarification around what we should be doing in terms of our data protection compliance activities. Now, this session will be a little bit different from the, the one that we had before. It will be a far more interactive in our first session where we had the um, the commissioner, it was basically persons just listening to what um, the speakers had to say. In this meeting, we're hoping to be able to, to, to invite persons to share their own thoughts around their own moves towards, um, um, your own move towards um, data, com data Protection um, Act compliance. And of course, um, let me just move straight into introducing our speakers. So first, let me welcome everyone. Everyone is on a call. Um, on 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 this um session, and let me move straight into welcoming our special guest this afternoon. And so, as I said before, when we made the decision to have this session, um, coming out of our last um chapter meeting, and the question was asked, who do we invite? I think um Mr. Christopher Record, who I'll introduce now, was one of the persons who came out as one someone who I believe and we believe would be very, very, um, you know, sort of very important in terms of, you know, what he does and what he represents. But let me just quickly introduce um, Mr. Record before he, he um, takes the floor. Um, and just to kind of, um, you know, outline how this will work, we'll have um, uh, Mr. 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 Record, Mr. Christopher Record speaking. And then once he's done, we'll move straight into the Q&A where persons can ask questions and have all their concerns um, addressed. Now, Mr. Record, um, is someone who I personally have known for, for a very long time. And of course, for those of us on the call who are who are wine lovers, I mean, I think um how I how I sort of came to know um Christopher was his, I think, you know, I think Christopher is the leading voice on an expert on on on, on everything wines in, in Jamaica. And I say that without any question. I think he has, has he has been in at the forefront of of um of this this idea of what wines you know what wines represent in our culture and so that's essentially how I, I met him but he's far more than a wine aficionado um he's also one of Jamaica's leading technology voices he's um a speaker an author he's an IT consultant he's a, he's also a facilitator where he does a lot of training within the space cybersecurity data protection digital and AI transformation exponential technologies, IT infrastructure, and things of that nature. Now, as far as this session goes, um, Christopher, Christopher, Mr. Record serves as the chairman and data protection, chairman of the Data Protection Oversight Committee at the Office of the Information Commissioner. And of course, as the name, as the title suggests, he sits at the helm of, of what we believe or what we know to be the sort of the, 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 the the, the, the persons who are overseeing what's happening at the OIC. And so he, he holds that specific position. In addition to that, he, he also is uh, uh, the head of the, the national, the Jamaica National Artificial Intelligence um, Task Force, where that body is actually looking at how we can leverage AI to advance Jamaica's interest in terms of technology. And so generally, I think, um, and, he's, and he's, a, he's an accomplished author as well. But without further ado, I mean, I think um, we're here to hear from him in terms, you know, with respect to, um, to our data protection issues that we're having. And so let me just take this opportunity to welcome Mr. Redford, Mr. Christopher Redford, to our meeting. And of course, open the floor to him to speak to us 
on all things data protection. Um, thank you very much, everyone, and, and welcome, Christopher. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very, very much, Eldin, for your very kind introduction. Um, I see one or two names here that I know or that I have been, I've worked with before in my capacity as, um, I guess, wine enthusiast and just being in the tourism space a little bit. So, so th thanks for the thanks for the introduction. And I reached out to the information commissioner uh, earlier to have a discussion around what content and what topic was covered before, because I didn't want to be re reinventing the wheel. Uh, we also hosted, we I put on my hat as um, chair of, similar to what Aldean does for this organization, I'm the chair of the Innovation and Digital Transformation Committee for the Private Sector Organization of Jamaica. And we had a session recently with the Office of the Information Commissioner, and we had about 900 registrants and um, 550 or close to 600 persons turning up to that session, uh, that two hour session where it was robust discussion, uh, had a you know 90 minute presentation and then a dense, a dense 30 minute Q&A, which, um, which covered a vast array of topics at about a hundred questions. What was effective in that discussion was the use of the, of the chat here. And what I'd also like to do is, is a similar thing where questions that you have on your mind right now, just drop it in the chat. Um, because one of the things that that allows is for us later on to pull all those questions and ensure that every one of them goes answered because I'm sure that I will not be able to answer every question that's posed right now. Some of these questions are for the Office of the Information Commissioner specifically that may come up. And so I'm, I'm just suggesting whatever questions come to your mind, there is no stupid questions, there's no bad questions, just throw those questions in the chat and we will ensure that they're all handled. So. I do. Um, I did reach out uh, to the office, as, as I mentioned. I spoke to the commissioner. I spoke to other persons in the office, and similar content that was used at the PSOJ's presentation. I mean, I have those entire forty-seven slides. I will not go through forty-seven slides today. I, I promise you. Um, I will go to. I will share a few slides. But the first thing I want to speak about is something that Aldin mentioned a while ago with respect to the minister's announcement of a grace period. And the grace period is just that. It's a grace period. And what's happened here is that, and maybe I could also, well, I, won't, I don't need to share the slides, but I could, I could um, give you a high-level overview and understanding of where that came from. And that situation came from uh, PSOJ, general private sector, Chamber of Commerce, uh, a number of organizations did intern internal surveys. So for the various boards and committees I sit on, I am I'm in touch with the minister that has responsibility now for the data protection act very regularly, uh, almost on a weekly basis. And the PSOJ looked to its members for feedback around their readiness with respect to the Data Protection Act. And a survey was conducted. And the survey, um, I will just actually bring it up and share, share some of the results from that, um, from that ready, readiness assessment. So let me just go ahead and share my screen. Uh, I'll then I hope I have permission to share screen. OK, it seems that I do. So let me just share it. It's, it's literally a, a handful of slides. I'm not going to, I'm not going to bore everyone too much here. Um, so the, put that in full screen mode. Ali, let me know when you're seeing the slides or any, anyone can just shout. Yes, yes. good, good so, to go. Seeing it, seeing it. Yeah, man. All right, fantastic. So um, it was done in October. A uh, wide range of sectors uh, covered in this, in this reach out. Um, as you say, accommodation <laughs> and food services was actually the largest sector, interestingly enough. Um, most people, 96% uh, knew about the act and knew about the, the December 1 deadline. Um, you know, 4%, 4.5% didn't. So this was the this slide was the information that said, look, we need to write a letter to the Office of the Prime Minister uh, making some sort of a, a 
request for any sort of accommodation that is possible, where 6.6% .6 said that they were fully prepared and ready, that all their ducks in a row, and 48.9% um, were partially ready, and then 44% uh, were between zero to 50% ready. In other words, not that prepared for, the, for, for what was going on. The range of reasons that were given for this included some of the highlights that I will show right now. Understanding the requirements, understanding the penalties, what's required for registration. Some people complain that there's info, insufficient information um, that, that, that they had around, around the act. Uh, finding adequate personnel, lack of clarity on, on, on how to manage the data that they had. And a lot of folks complained that the time constraint for December 1 was, was onerous. So a high level, that was the, this was the survey, these were the results. And these were um, from this, we made a, we made a, 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 a sent a letter to the, um, the office of the prime minister, specifically to the minister, with responsible for, with responsibility for the act and for um, digital transformation in general, just seeking some assistance and seeking for some sort of accommodation to to, to help folks who not were not ready. So after some back and forth and some discussion. Um, The act has a number of uh, a number of sections, a number of clauses, um, and what happened in December 1, 2021, and I will share a uh, I'll share a uh, I'll share a little one pager that was kind of sort of created as we attempted as as myself and the Office of the Information Commissioner um, attempted to give some clarity to some people around um, what has been happening since then. So the discussion for this act, for those who don't know, is not new. We've been talking about the Data Protection Act for um, many years. <laughs> um, I think discussion started back in 2017, um, 2018, and then the act itself came into effect fully on, well, not fully, but partially on December 1, 2021, where a number of sections, 2, 4, 56, 57, and I'm rattling off some numbers that you don't have in front of you, but anyone can download the Data Protection Act from uh, a multiple of sites that are there. GIS has it, the um, MSET website has it, Office of Information Commission has it. So if we just type Data Protection Act 2020 or Jamaica Data Protection Act 2020, you can download the act and it's it's not heavy legal reading and but you could go go through it in a, in a couple of hours to kind of understand what it's talking about so this december 1 2021 a number of things were um were effective from that date because without the act we could not have created the office of the information commissioner and um so the act allowed us to do that so the Office of Information Commissioner was established. The Data Protection Oversight Committee, which I chair, was, um, was established. And Jamaica's first Information Commissioner was appointed. All effective December 1, 2021. And from then, the public was given two years to, to become ready to become um, ready for registration, uh, but sadly, um, I don't want to jump and say culturally, uh, we're last minute people, but I think a lot of people will agree that we wait until the absolute very last minute before we do anything. And so that all also has happened with this specific act. As by the way, with many other acts, we heard the noise about the traffic act, we heard the noise about many different acts. So for the folks that are just joining, I suggested that we um, we just Add questions in the chat, in the Zoom chat, for anything that pops to your mind, because then we may not be able to get every single solitary question. So once it's documented, it's easier for me to share it with the Office of Information Commissioner to ensure that we answer um, your organization. So very, very high level, those are some of the dates and times that were that were there. So in terms of in terms of what components of the act was was um enabled back then the screen that I'm sharing 
kind of sort of high level um, breaks it down where some sections, especially the interpretation and objects, the, you know, the, the information commissioner's role, um, the reports and guidelines, allowance for us to seek uh, international cooperation and then creation of regulations and all. All of those things were enacted from December 1, 2021. And then what was given two years was the bringing into force the rights of the data subject and others, the requirements of the data controllers, standards for processing, uh, miscellaneous and general. So these are other things that should have been enacted or were, sorry, were enacted December 1 this year, 2023. What the minister's allowance did was put a pause on several sections. The sections that would make it an offense for not processing, uh, for not registering and you're still processing private um, personal data and also failure to report any breach within 72 hours. Those things are an offense under the law, but those things were given the, 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 the six month, the six month grace period. Um, other things that were given the grace period, sections 44 to 55 and 47, the enforcement section, um, fixed penalty sections, appeals tribunal section and appeal tribunal. So those sections were the only sections that were given the grace period. So in fact, December 1 that just passed, December 1, 2023, the Data Protection Act did in fact come into effect with a few exceptions to a few sections. So there's a fair amount of people that are out there saying that, oh, the act is not in effect yet. No, the act is in effect. It's just that the sections that you can get locked up and get thrown in jail because you're, you have not registered, those sections have been given a little six month leeway for people to get ready, right? So that is the main thing. Um, that's the difference. So with respect to with respect to the other key things that one needs to kind of understand very, very high level, I will jump back and share a different screen that, screen that speaks about the four terms, the data subject, the data protection officer, um, data controller, data processor, and personal data. Those are kind of the high level uh, components of what, um, you know, the, the main terms that folks and, and, and business um, persons who are in fact with either, who are in fact providing services or just a part of the ecosystem of data privacy. These are the terms that they throw out a lot and a fair amount of times sometimes kind of sort of confuse people around what these things mean, right? So again, before I switch from this screen that has a summary of status of provisions, again, just a reminder, December 1, some, December 1, 2021, a number of um, sections in the app became, became enforced. And then December 1, 2023, other sections of the app became enforced. And then the six month grace period is on mainly the sections that deal with either enforcement or making it an offense or not registering while you're still processing data. So the six month grace period is given for everyone to get on the gas and complete their the necessary components of what's required for registration. I will share very high level what's required for registration shortly, right? But the six month grace period is not a period of time that, oh, sure, we're good. We don't have nothing for about. Let's stop. No, that's not. That's not why the six months grace period was was given. And sadly, some people are taking it as that to their detriment. Because if a data subject complains that you are mishandling their private information and reports that to the commissioner, that organization, that data controller, is going to be in problems. Right. So I'll go back and jump to um a different screen and just show some of the core terms around around um, what we're working on, all right? So I will just do a quick peep and look in the chat to see what. Not a part of initial meeting, was only privy to second on information. How do I get started, register? Can the process be initiated online? So to answer that question, the process is only <laughs> gonna be handled online. So everyone, you can go to the Office of Information Commissioner website right now 
and you can you can start your process by opening do, what we call opening an account so you have your own um your, your own information in there so that once the regulations are ready you will get the the entire to do process how to register all sent to you so right now you can go to the site and it's um oic.gov.jm i'll drop it in the chat <clears throat> oic.gov.jm and you can open your account to begin your registration process. That can happen right this second. Um, so that was Tyrone asking that question, how do I get started? You get started by opening an account to the Office of the Information Commissioner. Can the process be initiated online? Yes, 100%. You're not doing anything in person, right? All right, how is the monitoring of the levels of compliance plan to be carried out by the government? That was Chris asking. How is the monitoring of the level of compliance? Oh, that's the same question um, by the government. Okay, so Jamaica is new to this data privacy thing. And the monitoring of the compliance will come about when the monitoring of the, of the compliance will come about using all these components, all these folks on the screen here. So we'll talk about the data. The data subject is why this act is here to protect the data subject. Who's the data subject? Me, you, every single solitary person <clears throat> that uh, lives and works in Jamaica is a data subject, right? And if you're processing people's data, then you're a data controller. So do you have staff? Do you have their names, addresses, phone numbers, bank account information? What information that you have uh, that can identify that Chris record is Chris record, that is personal data. Um, Sophia asks, only in Jamaica? No, so you can have data controllers that are not in Jamaica. You can have data um, protection officers that are not in Jamaica. So short answer there, no, not only in Jamaica. But if you are, um, right now, yes, we are, we are talking to businesses that are in Jamaica processing um, folks doing processing data subjects, private data here in Jamaica. But there are organizations that are outside of Jamaica. So for example, um, some of you may have service providers that are handling your payroll. You may have service providers, uh, for example, a cloud provider. You may, have, uh, you may be using a software application that you are using to run your hotel or uh, run you know, your front desk. Um, so under the act, that is a data processor, right? And a data processor is any person other than the employee of the data controller who processes data on behalf of the data controller. So that's one of the that's one of the, 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 the things that um that are as what we have on the screen as core terms, right? However, the act is focused on you, the person who has the relationship and the contractual arrangement with or who has the um you have the you, you the controller have the direct touch point with the data subject and then your your data processor has the direct touch point with you right so we're not going to lock up the data processor we're going to lock up you <laughs> and sorry to use that term because uh we, we have to do this sometimes to get everyone engaged and realize that this thing is is is, is a serious thing right um, Roxanne Smith asking, is a company a data subject? A, a company is not a data subject. A company is a data controller or a data processor. An individual is a data subject, right? So remember, the Data Protection Act is there to protect data subjects and their private information. All right, let me just jump back on this other screen. Sometimes you have too many screens. I have to try to look and focus on everybody. I'm just checking to see if there's anybody, um, anybody's hands up, if anybody wants to jump in. All right, so in terms of other things that I will kind of cover here, the rights of the data subject, there are some folks who weren't here for the first presentation. I wasn't in the first presentation at all. I don't know to what depth the information commissioner went into, but the data subject, the data subject has a number of rights, right? Data subjects have rights to access information about the, the collection, use, storage, and disclosure of their own personal data. So if I am applying for a job 
or if I'm applying for a service that you offer and you are collecting a barrage, a pile of information, I can question why you're providing this information, how long are you holding it for? Um, those are some of the things that folks want to find out about um, data that's handling itself. Remember guys, we have a situation where there are some folk, there are some, com um, some companies outside of this country and some inside that have made billions of dollars by taking your private data and doing a lot of things with it and selling it to people over and over again and um, profiting from it. And you didn't give anybody permission to do that. And so what's happening is that similar to what happened back in 2018, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Act, came in for force in Europe. So a question someone is asking about somebody's personal data outside of the country. The GDPR handles what we're doing here, the DPA, for Europe. So European citizens globally, wherever they are in the world, we have to comply with that act. And I'm sure some of you folks who have um, agents in, in, in Europe, um, back in 2016, the flurry of uh, a communication up to their enforcement in 2018, but they also had a two-year two window. So those are some of the um, things. So right to <clears throat> prevent processing, data subjects have a right to request that a data controller stop processing or not process their personal data in specific situations. Um, the right to data portability. So for example, this is something that happens a, a, a lot with the telcos where I have an account with one telco or with one bank and I'm now moving banks. I have to go to the next bank or the next telco and fill out the exact same information all over again. The act now allows you, the data subject, to go to that institution and ask them to transmit your data from one location to the next location, right? And they're, so, so these are the things now. So if you listen around a, a lot of these um, rights that the data subject have, you have to put your organization in a readiness state that if some, a data subject, one of your staff members, one of your customers, ask to remove all their data, they're no longer working with you, they know you have their data still. They wanted to remove it out of their system. And they come to you and say, please delete my information from everywhere. You have to have the ability to do that. And if there's something happened and they realize that, oh, they're still processing my data, then they go complain to the commissioner. Then the commissioner will come in and audit. So Chris had asked a question. Let me see if I can try to get up the questions on the screen at the same time. Uh, someone had asked a question around, um, around auditing. And what is where is the chat? And what is happening? What will happen is that when there's a complaint, that is when the that is when the, the um the information commissioner will kick in to come and do the audit and send their team in. Right. Okay. So I have that on that screen, and I have this on this screen. All right. Sometimes it's good when you have three screens, you know, but sometimes it can be confusing. Right. So. All right, any other questions that I need to answer here? No, no other questions here. All right. So in terms of the other rights, I'm going to just rattle through right to avoid automated decisions. So there are some institutions, some organizations, financial institutions um, do this a lot, where if you're applying for a loan, they have an automated process that they put in information that they got from you. The system comes to a recommendation as to whether to provide a loan or not provide a loan. Um, the act provides the ability to look into that process to figure out how that process works, right? So decisions about data subjects, those with legal consequences should not be made solely through automated data processing. That's the whole spirit right there. So you as a data subject have the right uh, to conclusions based upon human review. Because the algorithm that is built into whatever software that somebody wrote for you may not understand a, the, a, the person's situation that you are staring on in front of you right, right then and there. So, so, so the act now gives the ability for you to look into that process and, 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 and ask the organization to make a human decision based upon information instead of just having AI or a technology, um, a piece of technology algorithm do it, right? Of course, right to rect um, uh, recti rectification. <laughs> in other words, if information is complete, I mean, my name is 
Christopher record. 99% of people somehow magically see an F in my last name, or my father used to have a field day, and the ability to fix that. You know, there was a situation once where when I got my, when I when, when, when we had the TRN and, and I got my first TRN card, it was incorrect. My last name was spelled incorrectly. And they started saying that I need to refill out the forms. I mean, I got ballistic on them, right? The manager to the supervisor, the manager to the manager, whatever. And I said, go back to your source documents. Everything I filled out was correct. And you are now sending me an incorrect form. I am not doing anything else. Send me the correct form now. So they had their thing. They got back to me, apologized. And yes, the correct thing was done. So right to rectification is there. The data control controllers, you, the data controller as a company, must take responsibility, responsible steps to ensure data accuracy within 13 days. If me, the data subject, see any incorrect information going on there. So um, I'm also justice of the peace. And just this morning, I got a document to sign to witness and the person, similar situation as mine, the person's uh, name was spelled incorrectly. They're standing here holding their heads. I said, well, it's called by the company. So luckily, they were able to get that fixed. The new form was emailed. I printed it here, stamped it, signed it, and then we're, you know, we're, we're on our way. But it's now in the law that this must be done because there are some people that really push back and really you know, make it very hard for you to fix information by asking it to refill forms out again. No, the law says it's you, Mr. Controller. You need to fix it, right? Um, obligations of the data controller. So your organization needs to register. You need to submit annual data protection impact assessments. In other words, how do you process personal data? When you collect information for people registering to stay there, stay at your establishments or, um, or buy your services, how is it? ingested where does it go how many different people see it right um slight rabbit hole story i am with my adhd i'm known for that i, I jump down a rabbit hole every now and then the, the 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 um the pandemic created a new industry or enhanced a new industry in jamaica the delivery industry and lots of these bike people popped up and I, I, I had this scenario, which is a real actual situation that happened where you order food from a restaurant. That restaurant now has an arrangement with up to five different delivery companies to take the food to your house. So they have to give your personal information, your name, your phone number, your address to a bike man who you know from Adam, that bike man that is coming to your house to deliver food that you're going to eat. And okay, to some people that may be scary, but here's where things got strange with one specific uh, case where some places in Kingston can be kind of complicated to find. So the bike man has your number. The bike man calls you, where do you live? You give him the address, you give him the directions, turn left here, turn right there. Then you are waiting, 30 minutes gone, based upon the man said he should have been here five minutes ago, you call him back. Oh, he's lost and you, you direct him to where to go and then um, he hangs up the phone, you have to call him back again. So there's back and forth conversation with the bike man. Bike man finally gets to your gate, finally comes inside, delivers your food and you're good to go. A day later, you receive a call from a female voice asking, where I call my man for? Right? And it so 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 when this case was presented and I and, and I had to call the owner of the company to say, look, one of your processors, because me or my wife or any female who was calling that bike man to deliver to find out that the pizza is we did not have any direct relationship with that company. We had a direct relationship with the company that ordered the food. So when the data protection impact assessment is done, you need to state, when you collect some of this private information, who do you send it to? Where does it go? Where is it stored? What happens to it? How long is it kept before it's deleted? Because in that scenario, 
somebody else took up the phone, because the man reached home, his significant other takes up this phone and see a woman's name, calling him three times. And we know bad things can happen from that. And takes the right down the number, calls and starts to have interaction. Totally out of place, should never have happened. Um, and <laughs> yeah, so yeah, th that's a case and that's a real case that actually happened, right? So one scenario there, you know, I, I put this out in front of an audience of, of IT professionals that I had um, doing a presentation three, four weeks ago. And the discussion, well, the company should provide phones or, you know, because what's happening right now is a lot of the riders are using their own phones, right? And if the company provides a phone and it's their property, then they can put in technological solutions around protecting that data that you're handing. So we're not here to solve that problem, but I'm just throwing it out as a case, right? Um, how long should I hold employee information? And if they ask for it to be moved, um, can I do it? <laughs> Yes, Robin, good question. And that question came up um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a legal situation that we're in just this past week. So some of these cases and some of these um, um, you know, use cases, not all of them have been fully fleshed out as yet. Because to add to that question that Robin asked, hold on, uh, can I hold on to it? If your organization has specific policies that overwrite this, then that's fine. It was declared. The, the staff member or customer signed on to that declaration. Remember, it is all about consent, you know. I'm going to jump back to one of the slides here. Right to access, right? So the data subject gives consent. Now, one of the things that has to happen in the act that you have to understand is that the data subject can take back the consent, right? But if you have policies, and of course, we have other laws because other laws in this country may override um, you know, I, I need for you to keep financial data for seven years. I need for you to keep keep information like that. So those laws can override it. So one of the things that we don't want to happen is people to get bent out of shape around this thing. And that kind of was happening within the first, you know, you know, 2021, 2022, as we went out on the road and did a lot of presentations out there. People were really and truly overthinking it, right? And what we're trying to just calm everybody down to say, look, let's not get nervous about December 1. Let's just understand where, how you store, where you're storing it, and what are the things that you're putting in place to, to protect this data. So that is um, standard seven of the act. Standard seven speaks to um, protecting that data. And the law actually calls for some specific technological solutions. And we'll just go through them. Do I have that in this slide here? Let me see. Oh, no, this doesn't go into the level of detail. Um, no. So, um, but one of the things that uh, one of the things that should happen is that you put in certain certain technical measures to protect the data. One of them is encrypting the data, because if if your business is hacked or there's some sort of a cybersecurity incident, and all of your customers' private data is now out of street, um, the investigation will take place, and they, the first thing will be what did you have in place? And if you can't show that you had anything adequate in place to protect that data, then we're in, in, in some serious problems. And this has happened globally, by the way. This is not a Jamaica thing. Jamaica is 40 years late into doing this. Other jurisdictions have done this. I had a, I had a chance to meet with the Danish Information Commissioner uh, last month. And what we did in December 1 here is what they did in 1979, 44 years ago. So, you know, I've heard people complaining that this is onerous. I'm like, guys, this is this is this is when an when a country is trying to grow up from from underdeveloped to becoming developed. These are some of the things that we have to go through, right? Um, how long should I hold information for Robin? That's that's kind of up to you. If 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 you think based upon the history of of your business that you generally need to go back to this data within a year, two, three, I think that I, I think you have to have some sort of a uh, some sort of a policy within an organization to what that is, right? Um, from Frank, what having WhatsApp groups with staff where obvious numbers of individuals and their names are shown would this cause a problem? All right, so I've been having a lot of questions around um, this type of communication, WhatsApp groups. <laughs> Interestingly enough, friends of mine work with Scotia and they have put in a complete new policy for their WhatsApp groups, right? 
and they actually have and because if, if you use whatsapp business you can automatically send out um statements to people to let them understand that this is a business account here's what will happen when you send information to this business account bam 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 so generally having whatsapp groups with staff members uh, numbers and all that are, is not a problem as long as the staff members approve same so for example even with me with the data protection oversight committee um we decided to form a whatsapp group and of course on my committee is like five lawyers four lawyers right and then the rest as, as, as technical folks said okay folks i need everybody's permission to add their name to this group and in giving me your permission here's what we're going to discuss and here's how long we're going to keep it for because all of us received our letter of appointment from the uh, from the um i may probably can't say this but from the from the from the the governor general to serve for a period of three years. So we're, ha we're, we're, we're having our WhatsApp group for that period of time for this purpose. Do we have your approval put on a WhatsApp group? Yes, bam, you're good. You have the approval. So you create a WhatsApp group with your management team. You create a WhatsApp group with, with, with different, um, oops, I just realized I put the OIC and I put it only to Tyrone. and I need to put it to everybody. Sorry, 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 sorry. Put it to everyone. Right. So as long as you get consent, and all that needs to happen, because people keep on saying, I didn't know. And that's what we want to get away from. I didn't know that's how you're using the data. I didn't know. So many of us never, ever read. <laughs> I did this presentation. I was at um, a hotel on the North Coast. We had about 100 people in the room doing the presentation. And when I went through all of these slides about their consent, I just asked a question. I said, okay, guys, um, some of you have been here from last night. Some of us just came in this morning and checked in. I said, how many people can remember and tell me one or two things on the privacy consent form that you signed? Out of the 40 or 50 people in the room, half of them did not realize that they signed a consent form. I took up the same form that they all signed in the room and held it up. I said, see it right here. It says privacy policy. And you signed it. So we have a situation, culturally, it's not a Jamaica-only situation. Most of us don't read any of these things. None of you have, have read the Instagram. I shouldn't say none of you. Most of you have not read the Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn um, privacy statement at all. We click on because we want the service. So we have to give something to get something. right? So it's the same thing with our organizations. Um, we have to create something in there, which is why the, which is why the assistance from organizations offering services, whether it's DPA ready, whether it's design privacy, whether it's uh, T-Tech, whether it's uh, uh, um, info, info Exchange, whether it's any of the organizations in Jamaica providing cybersecurity solutions and data privacy solutions, which is why uh, so, some of them are offering small and medium-sized business uh, solutions for smaller properties, which is why some people have brought in their own attorneys on retainer for six months to help them to create some of these policies. So that's why it's needed, you know, we, we need help. And we get a six months great period. We, we, we cannot squander the six months grace period. We have to jump on the gas now. All right. Um, somebody made a comment. Be clear, does the act therefore dictate that an ex-employee has the right to have deleterious behavior? that may let his termination removed from the employee's file. Hold on, no, 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 no. All right, and this is where, guys, we have to be, um, we're not saying that if you have a file on the person and they're asked to remove all their information, which is why you need to create your policy. So if you create your policy that says, I am going to keep this information for 10 years or for five years, or I am going to keep information which has something to do with the employment. So remember, you can create whatever you want to create in your in in in, in your in your business, as long as that is the is that is that is that is shared with the data subject, and as long as the data subject gave consent. Right? I don't know who remember when the Data Protection Act was coming. Um, sorry, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Act for Europe, was coming into play. Every single European blog that I subscribed to. I got an email from every single solitaire soul like on the day. Do you still want to continue to get information from this blog? Please give me permission to continue to use your own email. 
So, you know, you, you kind of decide, all right, this is important. Okay, yes, okay, yes, okay, yes, okay, yes. So those guys by that one statement in their mind protected themselves because they got my consent to keep using my, my email address to send me information. So it's the same thing with organizations. Um, you have to set your own policy, have the company agree upon it to, to um, have the company agree upon it. So again, um, we, we, we just had a launch of a new cybersecurity organization um, recently this week. And this very same question came up that um, Chris, that the comment you make here, where, and, 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 and I'll create another scenario, right? And the other scenario is I'm working for your organization. I was working there for five or six years and then we had a disagreement and I am no longer working there, right? I didn't say who fired who, right? But we have a disagreement and I'm no longer working there. And then a year later, I've come to learn about this Data Protection Act and I come and I said, remove all information pertaining to me, my personal information, you know, my personal information. And you removed it. And then I meet a smart lawyer who says, hey, you know, you have a case with this organization because of the way the dismissal took place. Then all of a sudden now you have a case, but guess what? You have asked him to remove all the data. What happens then? So that's a real, um, a, a real use case that we throw out for discussion. So remember, we are brand spanking new to this scenario. We have not, we have not aired out and fleshed out all these scenarios as yet. Um, so I am sure that there'll be amendments and things to, uh, you know, things to fix down the line. There was, uh, so <clears throat> one of the data protection organizations that um, my former employee, so I used to be the CEO of a company called T-Tech Limited, I left a year ago. And at the time, I partnered with an organization called Design Privacy. To, so we did a cybersecurity section. They did the data privacy section, right? And they did all the legal work to all our customers, right? One of the things that they did to bring up their staff and their all their customers is that every week, they reviewed a European case. And there was an interesting European case that, uh, you know, stuck in my mind was, was in Italy, where... Uh, employee left the employment, resigned from the company, left the company. Um, in that country, the GDPR didn't come into effect as yet, but the employee was very, very smart. They knew when the act was gonna come in place. So they, they said, no, they resigned from the company six months before the act was in effect. And then when the act became in effect, what they started doing, they started sending back emails to their own email address that they had in the company. Realizing that it wasn't bouncing back. It was still going. And somebody else was reading their own email. So they put together a legal case and they came at the company to say that you have not deleted me. Uh, and I'm, and they, want, they actually won the case around. Um, they want custody of every single Salter email that came to them over the last year that they have been gone. And the Italian, um, I'm sure it was Italian, I, I may be mistaken, but one of the European organizations, um, the Data Protection Authority there, granted the, the complainant uh, the, 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 and, and won the case. And so they actually had to get custody of every single solitary email that was, was going to their former name, which is because they left the company and the, and the organization didn't delete their presence in the company. So of course, some of the recommendations that we have taken out of you looking at those cases include, so instead of having somebody's name, so instead of having, for example, um, Robin Russell at his organization.com or Tyrone W has it in, in so for certain positions we just put the position name so it is it is it is administrator at dot, dot com it is sales it is marketing so at a high level those are some of the things that um we, we kind of you know recommendations that were made by legal people to get around that all right I think I've chatted enough and maybe I've confused some people maybe I've cleared up let me just go to one more slide. Requirements for registration. So to register, the, the regulations are not yet completed, right? However, when I spoke to the information commissioner earlier, she said to me, she kind of gave me some high-level overview of what the registration um, situation will look like, right? Um, and... 
Well, let me just continue showing back the screen because this kind of sort of covers most of what. Because what she sent to me, she said, Chairman, you cannot share this with anyone as yet because we have not gotten approval for it as yet. So I'll just speak from it very high level as to some of the things that are required. And some of this will be the first time ever that this is being repeated anywhere because it is just all happening at the same time. All right, so I'll just put back up this original screen that I had and run through some of the things while I, while I look straight on the actual process of registration from the draft document that was sent to me. So the controller's details will be required for registration, which of course is your name, address, contact information there. Um, whether you are a government organization or not, right? public organization or not. And then of course the contact information for the person who is responsible for data privacy. So whether it's a DPO or not. So not every single solitary organization requires a DPO simply because of the size of the organization and how much, um, how much data you're processing. If you're a tiny organization, you know, chicken man don't need a DPO, you know. Um, so the category of the controller as a public authority or, or other, right? Are you a ministry? Are you a statutory body, a local government? Uh, are, are you a commission of parliament? Uh, you're a limited liability company, a sole proprietor. So those things that um, you need to know. Your permanent, your office location, address location. And then, of course, here's the hard part now. Um, describe the data you process, what type of general description of the services you offer, and the type of information that you process. Right. So this is where things get a little tricky because this is where you have to know put in a little bit of work, which is why if you have the way we thought to do it internally, great. But if not, this is kind of the assistance that someone who's been doing this for the last two years and helping other people can come in and actually help you to do this work, right? So you have personal data and then you have sensitive personal data. So sensitive personal data includes health-related things, right? DNA, biometric, um, photograph of a person. Photograph is actually sensitive personal data because seeing a name is one thing, seeing a phone number, Seeing an address is one thing, but if I see a picture of you, then that's different. Um, political, if, you know, because some of us uh, as Jamaicans, as we all know, out there are very loudly about um, political affiliation and also religious affiliation. So some of these things are uh, processed in some organizations and the commissioner in the registration would like to know, do you process any of this type of data, right? So citizens, non-citizens, because we do have people here living in Jamaica doing work for whether it's embassies or um, any kind of international organizations that may be living here for, for um, you know, three years, a period of time. So the categorization of your data subjects, the commissioner would like to know what categorization are you, are, are you processing? Reason for processing, purpose for processing, you know, is it performance for contract? Compliance with legal obligation, necessity to protect vital interest, archiving in personal interest, scientific research. That's, so these are the kind of things that uh, one will have to fill out as you register, right? Persons to whom this information is disclosed. And so that's another thing as I gave the whole case study with the food delivery. If I'm collecting your information to provide your service, who else am I putting this, sending this information to, right? What is the duration for which the personal data you process is kept? That's actually a question that is there, right? Um, so at the high level, I'll leave that right there and let me see if there's any other things. So I'm gonna jump on this screen that I'm sharing here, just down to the, um, down to the, the penalties for non-compliance. General non-compliance fines up to $10 million, imprisonment for up to 10 years. For corporations, 4%, of the previous year's annual gross worldwide turnover and payable by, <clears throat> by any or all of the following, either the entity, an officer or member uh, uh, proven to be guilty or anyone acting in capacity of an officer or member are proven to be guilty. So the penalties are not play play penalties. Um, and this obviously will require investigation to take place to see was the organization in compliance with the Data Protection Act? Did they put in the necessary technical measures and organizational measures to do everything in their power to prevent this um, <clears throat> activity from happening, whether it's a 
hack that um, occurred or some other thing that um, a data subject is complaining about. Enforcement mechanisms, as I said, these are the components that are on pause for the six months, right? Not the requirement for registration and all that kind of stuff, but the enforcement mechanisms, the enforcement notices, assessment notices, information notices, fixed penalty notices. Those will not be sent if somebody comes and complains to the commissioner that you are, you know, not doing what they're supposed to do. All right, service criminal prosecution, civil suit, monitoring and regulation of controller, um, assessments as a monitoring tool, annual EPAs and all of those things. Right. Um, okay, so I'm gonna end there right now. I have spoken enough. Nick, go ahead. Hi, Chris. I um, appreciate all of the insights. Um, as you know, I will have just one simple question in regards to the penalty. 4% of revenues is, um, how, how was that figure? Um, how, did, how did the the government come to that figure for that penalty? And have they spent even 30 seconds to consider how um, outlandish the concept is? This is what pertains to the rest of the world. So they just they just copy the same thing from the rest of the world. A hundred over a hundred other countries have the exact same same thing. Um, but so but, cert, but cert, cert, certainly this is not for a single instance. You know, you would you would have to show gross um, lack of, of oversight in the area of exactly. multiple of exactly. multiple instances for exactly. the, for the, for something like this to be concentrated. That is correct. so so in the, in the event that there is you know there's a complaint and it's found that there was an error that resulted in some personal information not being as closely guarded as it maybe could have then does the same standard apply? So I would have, it seems to be overly punitive. Well, the, the idea is they want it to comply. And um, no. So sure, far, the, the idea of all law is that there is a, an interest in compliance. Right. But I mean, 4% 4, 4 of, of, of revenues is large. It is, occurs to me that that's larger than virtually any other fine that could be levied for any other purpose against an organization. Correct. Yeah. It's so, a set value. Yeah, man, correct. So, 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 so again, um, you know, when, when, when the, when the multi-million dollar fines were levied against, you know, British Airways, um, against, you know, the big hotel industries in the US, in, in, um, in, in, in Europe, because they were, found to be uh, guilty of not um, putting in terms, you know, the the British, the British data commissioner, I mean, they went in hard and heavy, I mean, right? So, I'm hearing some feedback. I'm not too sure where it's coming from. Alden? Right, so, long and short of it, Nick, is that the, the, the whole idea is to get as many people to be to be compliant as possible. There is no there is no intention for somebody to come out swinging and be levying fines left, right, and center um, of that level. So it is it is up to that amount, uh, and 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 yes, it is for just a gross <laughs> mishandling, uh, no regard um, for 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 any sort of privacy and any sort of protection at all. That is kind of sort of what um would you know what would happen in in in, in, in that scenario. Right? Mm -hmm. One second, one second. Um while, while we take before we take another question, let me take the opportunity um to to, to acknowledge um our president um Robin. Um and we came on with, um after our introduction. Perhaps Robin if you could just um share a few words um Based on thoughts, I mean, I know you're one of the big proponents for us having this um this session this evening. 
So welcome and 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 um, thanks for your presence. And if you could, if you want to share just your thoughts, on, um, before we get to the next questions. Sorry, thank you, thank you, Aldin. Um, let me just say thanks first for putting some clarity into what we're doing. Um, I'm not going to take any time because nobody wants to hear me talk. Everybody wants to hear Chris talk, but. I just have one observation, Chris, and it's, it's kind of a little bit disappointing that the laws are in place, but yet we're still figuring out what to do or how to do it. Um, and I know that you know you're, you're speaking about some kind of you know some kind of understanding when it comes to whether we get it right or we get you know get it wrong, like you said, whether it's a gross um, misrepresentation or whatever it is, but when it comes to a courthouse and laws, what what stops a judge from giving judgment on December second to say, you know, you you breached it? What what, what stops that from happening? Just your unmute. Yeah, man. I just I just I just found the unmute. Yeah, man. Um. So this is a section that has the grace period plugged in, right? Which um, the, the, the part of the law that calls for the offenses that is that has not been put in put into um, has not been enforced as yet because of the newness of this law. I mean, take some heed that the, there's not going to be anyone jumping on. All right, you know, Robin, let me just tell you. Um, we had a meeting with some folks that were part of what they call the Global Privacy GPA, Global Privacy Agency. I remember the name of the last, the last A stand for. The Global Privacy Assembly. Over 150 countries are part of it. In this year's presentation, this year it was, it was held in Bermuda. What we are experiencing here is not new, right? Um, Europe has been leading data privacy and Caribbean has about 34 countries that within the last five years have put in data privacy acts and legislation around data privacy. And I'm not saying this to have any excuses or anything, but I'm just stating a reality. Every single solitary one of those countries are in the same situation as us. In other words, there is unsure, people are unsure around what pertains Matter of, and matter of fact, we are the most advanced. Our situation is the most advanced. People are now, people who have had, had their act in place before us are now looking to us for guidance as to how we're doing it because we're actually doing it. There was a study that was done um, by an organization and I, I, I could have actually sent this study to you guys to look at. They interviewed about 15 countries, their data protection authorities, and what we are experiencing here is the same thing. So, 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 when the global geopolitical pressure comes on on a small country like Jamaica to get our act together and put in laws like this, the various administrations, uh, and, and when I say administration, I'm not talking about PNP, GLP. I'm talking about how government is everybody together. It's not one side. Everybody has to agree. So I have parliament. The parliaments agree to putting these type of things, and then. The people who they call in to help her, and, and whether it's multinationals, whether it's international consultants, they all come in and they're all advising and, and, and suggesting and the technocrats do what they do. Robin, I'm just saying that we're all in this learning thing together. Um, the more advanced nations came out swinging hard and they levied massive fines against the huge, huge corporations that did not, um, did not do anything about it because they thought it was a joke. They said, sure, this thing is a waste of time. Nobody's not going to enforce this. And then if you look at any of the fines that were levied in Europe, you realize that, okay, the European authorities decided to come out swinging hard to make people realize that they were serious. So I don't think we are there. Um, I don't think we're going to be doing anything like that. But it's just to understand that this is what's in the law right now. We just need to understand the five or six little things that we need to do that we don't need to fall on the wrong side of it at all. 
Just do our registration, do all the DPI, deep, um, and deep data protection impact assessments, and, and we're good. Put in a little technical measures, because most of us would have put in some sort of a protection to protect our own IT systems anyways. And, you know, security, IT security, cybersecurity, data protection. The data protection piece is literally six or seven little things that you should be doing anyways as part of your IT security um, um, portfolio and, and, and things that you implement. So at the very high level, that's what I'll say uh, about the concern around the very onerous looking, um, looking act. But my main message here today is that six months was given for people to get on the gas, not get on the brake. Right, and the smaller your organization is, is the less stress you have just to make sure that you have a little policy, you have a little statement, and the two or three requirements. Right, I saw a hand up a while ago. Who put up the hand? Was it Sophie? Did it go up and come down? Thank you, Chris. Yeah, man, no problem, Robin. Let me jump back into the chat to see the what chat. is. Yes, Chris, Sophie had a question in the Where? chat. Okay, let me look at it. I think what would help the small hotels would be to have a template that we could start with. Surely this is probably available in other countries. It would guide us in this process. Yes, exactly, which is what um, organizations out there, um, Aldane, you have something going on, um, DPA ready, which is what those organizations do. Um, they design privacy, um, Meg, Meg's company, or company is called, I can't remember right now. You have about five or six organizations in Jamaica that are offering uh, templates or guidance for small, medium-sized organizations out there. So, and yes, some other countries, they did offer some sort of a template. Not the, not the authorities that came along later. It's usually um, legal organizations, cybersecurity organizations, entrepreneur businesses, that came to the rescue to try to help in some of this clarity. The more mature countries, um, people that have been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years, yes, they have a lot of um, a, a lot of guidance and help. The Danish data protection folks who I spoke to, she said the majority of her work right now is around just awareness, 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 letting people be aware of what's going on. Um, but we are we are bust. We're a baby in this thing, so we're all learning. The authority is learning, the administration is learning, and um, on both sides, we're all learning. Yes, Robin, go ahead. Thanks. Will there be a, a listing of persons who are registered data protection officers or persons who are experts or qualified to be giving advice on data protection? Like companies, etc., oh, etc. So I am going to actually go to the OIC, OIC.gov.gem. So when the office was initially stood up, before they had their own website, they had a list of, let me see if it is still there. Okay, useful links, data protection service providers, right? So they, I will share this screen. So to answer your question, there is a list. Now, <clears throat> this is not a list of any sort of uh, approval to say go to these people. What happened is that the, 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 the office, at the time when the office was being stood up back in 2021, went out to the market to see all the folks who were offering any sort of data. So this is the, so this is the website. I mean, I'm just showing the website to everybody. Everybody can see it, right? This is the website. Office of Information Commissioner, right? How to register as a data controller, request an assessment, um, things you need to know. So everything is there, right? In the resources section, they have um, the act itself, ministers read the draft of the regulations, various supports, and then there's a list of data protection service providers, right? But I think she has something written here that said it. Companies, persons listed below have been identified as individuals offering a range of products and or services that can assist data controllers to ensuring their compliance, right? The information given is as provided by said organizations and intended only to assist interested persons 
and identify. And then now they have a big disclaimer. This list is not exhaustive and may be updated from time to time. The office has makes no representation or warranty as to the qualification because we don't have that whole regime in place. It's just folks that were doing cybersecurity long before the act was even thought of. They were put on the list and then other people who put up their hands to say, well, they're offering these services. So there's a list of folks here. Um, 876 Solutions, I know. Um, as a matter of fact, the owner of that company and I just finished co-authoring a book on digital transformation. Um, Carter Lindo, I know we have done work with them before. Um, Design Privacy, I, I know. They've been doing work. DPO Caribbean. So there's a bunch of organizations that are here that, and all the, all the big players, KPMG, Hartney Red Fatter, um, PricewaterhouseCoopers, all these guys are listed here. Simtai. Um, yeah. So these are organizations that were in the business of providing some sort of either cybersecurity or legal. So it does give the breakdown of product service offered. So whether it's legal, technical, technical, legal, technical, it has it right there. So this is a starting list. Other people out there offering the services that names are not here. Right. Um, so yes. Hope I answered the question, Robin. Yeah, man, perfect, thanks. All right, open for questions. Any other questions? We have one here from Chris. Could you name those six to seven points that you had mentioned earlier regarding the points that the OIC needs every organization to be oh. aware of? I was about to say my ADHD is kicking in right now because I don't remember what the hell I said. Anyway, no, no. Okay. So let me so let me bring up let me, let me bring up the slides that um that 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 perhaps could answer. Um no, that is the survey. Oh, it is the compliance. All right. Um I've gone through them before. We'll go through them again. No, one, Chris. Yes. Sorry, it's just that you, you had you, you had towards the last part of your presentation, you had said. Um, so it's just five, six or seven things. It's just six or seven things that we need to. Right, to, right, um, right, right. So yes. so those are the points that you were. Uh, yeah, man. So, to. so these are them right here. Register, okay. submit, record, provide the data subject data. This is the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, okay. these are the seven. Right. Obligations okay. of the data controller. This is it right here. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Man. Come yeah, on, this is right here. Any other questions that anyone has ruminating around? Let me sit down. Tyrone W wrote something um, here. Yes, go ahead. Where are you? Yeah, let, let me. I'm just gonna show you. You had mentioned something about data subject request. I wanted to show share, share my screen to show what that looks like. Um, for persons who may not be aware, um, of what that really involves, you could stop sharing and I'll share. I'm trying to move my damn screen and it's not moving. Hold on here, let me. Oh, here it is. Stop sharing. All right, fire away. Start. Are you seeing the screen now? Yep. All right. So essentially, when we talk about data subject requests, and you mentioned it earlier in terms of the the customer must have the ability to to ask that their data be removed. Not on some sub page or some some onerous sort of um, email to, to to the company. There must be some clear way where the customer can request that their data be removed. And so this is what we 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 implement um for customers as well. Where you know obviously there's a it, it speaks to the privacy policy in terms of referring persons as well. But the user the the, the, the customer the the, the 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 end user should be able to um request that their, their their data be um removed or or deleted or or any anything of that nature and once it is submitted the data protection officer would ob obviously receive that and then act on it accordingly within the specific specific time and so i just want to point out that i mean in terms of this idea of persons having the right to request that their data be varied in some way this is something that must appear on your website or on any portal that you're you're showing to the customer at the end user. Um, and it's a very important part of the act as well. Thanks. Thanks for showing yeah. that. Yeah. 
I have, to, I have to make some um, changes to the so a question came. <clears throat> Will uh, can we get the presentation? All right, I have to go to the information commission and ask her to give me a, a sanitized version to make sure that I can share it. Uh, this came from the Office of the Information Commissioner. So yes, uh, we'll, we'll send out a we'll send out a version that can be that can be used. Any other questions, concerns? Challenges. I posted something in the chat earlier yes. in addition to what was said. Um, it basically, I was just asking about the retention uh, periods. What are the standards for specific certain types of um, data, whether it be email or person's information? Because if we are asked, for example, to give information on an employee like what the person like mm, what this person said here um what if our internal policy has a retention of two years for example just to, for argument's sake and we have removed that data what are the implications and what standard does nht or nis use to you know that 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 will make us obligated to keep that information what are the periods there right so as i mentioned earlier um as with any new law one has to be mindful of any other law that has uh, any sort of connection with it so as was mentioned here um, i think somebody said robin in my view that employee information has to be held for a substantial period of time so again if if, if there is a payroll law or there is some other specific thing that says it has to be there for 10, 15, 20 years, and that's already etched in stone as part of your policy, then, you know, um, your your employment contract. So, 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 folks, these are the things that the legal people come in and take a look at, right? And these are the things that are then rewritten in this new sort of um, data privacy policy, if you will, that all everybody in the organization has to then reread, come to an agreement, resign, all of that kind of stuff. Because there are going to be some things that are over, not, not overriding, because the Data Protection Act gives no stipulation as to any time period. It just says that you have to be able to answer the question when the person asks, how long are you keeping this for? You can say, well, I'm keeping it for 20 years because the National Hotel Association of the World says that I must keep information for hundred years, you know. So as long as you have the the process thought out, documented, and person sign on, sign on to that consent, you're gonna have some other things that override certain other. I'm not a lawyer; I'm more of a technical person. So I am. I put those things up front when I'm introducing myself. Um, I usually sometimes have to call my wife in the room. She is a lawyer. She's also a data privacy practitioner. <laughs> And so she helps with the legal, the legal section sometimes. So yes, um, you're gonna have situations where um where where other laws override override the laws that we are now talking about. Okay, thank you. So somebody mentioned um somebody mentioned that there is a GDPR training that Sanders does, which is very good. So we do have a few differences between the GDPR and the JDPA, right? Um, the GDPR does not require registration the way we are requiring it. Um, I've had different discussions with the technocrats in our own ministry as to why. And one interesting discussion that happened two weeks ago was around, again, after I came off the phone with the Danish Data Protection Authority folks, um, they, have, they, they, had, they had disposed of a number of things in their law and our own technocrats said, Chris, they can dispose of it now because they are 50 years down the road in doing it. We are just starting. So we have to get, it's almost like you're, you're training somebody to ride a bicycle. They have to have the training wheels on first and they keep going and going until they can balance and then we can take off the training wheels, right? 
So there's a number of things that are required in our act that are not required in the GDPR. So it's a challenge we also have when folks come back to Jamaica from the UK or they, they lived in a European country and they did some sort of a GDPR training and they come and, and say that they are experts in, in, in data privacy. All right, which data privacy? Because again, different jurisdictions have uh, different leanings and nuances. Um, most of it is, 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 is similar. There's a base foundation of it, but there are things that are different that, um, that we have to just become aware of. Not a tremendous amount of difference. So I just mentioned that because Somebody's um, thing there. Does a data controller have to be have to have certification to do the job, or can a, a person be trained to do it? A person can be trained to do it. There are a number of organizations right now partnering with education organizations that are um, certifying folks. So again, I mean the folks that I know about because I've I've done business with them um, is data privacy, design privacy. Design privacy had partnered with the Mona School of Business, uh, University of the West Indies to come up with uh, a sort of a program. And so they have graduated over 100 um, data protection officers um, in the year so far. I mean, I can get updated numbers. UTech, University of Technology, has also created a program and they have graduated over 100 data protection officers so far. So there are a bunch of folks that are in, put, in, put, in, put in some sort of a training and their own certification in place. Um, for it. So I hope that answered that question. All right, what time are we now? We're at four o'clock. I don't know what time. I think yes, we have. Yeah, we have um seven minutes. We're closing off at four. All right, no problem. Fantastic. Yeah. Any other questions? No question is stupid. The whole question is uh below. Anybody, please just throw out anything that's room uh, on your mind. Um, I will attempt to answer. I said going to the going to the um going to the data protection the 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 the, the office of information commissioner site is up a lot of the information is very um you know the site was just put uh in we'll talk next week uh Real hotel is ready for you all right so that's good yeah guys look my main my main call here is if you have somebody who is reaching out that will provide some assistance to help you do what you need to do. Have a discussion with them. Um, I know people have different budgetary capabilities, um, as we all do. Um, my suggestion is that uh, please negotiate. I mean, you know, uh, one of my colleagues had, um, one second, a company that is registered in Europe and compliant there, do they still have to register here? Yes, you have to register here simply because you are doing business here in Jamaica. And so if you're already compliant in Europe, then registering here is literally a bat upon catch. It, it, it's a no brainer because you practically have already have everything in place. So that should be smooth sailing and breezy um, if that person is already registered in another jurisdiction. That should be very, very easy. Matter of fact, you, you can probably come and give us some, some lessons. You can probably come and present at the next seminar. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Um, very, very, very well then. Um, well, before I get into the thank yous for, 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 for Christopher, let me, let me, let me say um, how happy I am to be a part of GHD. I mean, um, when you speak about leadership, Robin, certainly has been at the forefront of, of, of sort of speaking to the issues that matter most for us. I think, um, you know, obviously this is something that affects us as an industry and the fact that we're having, you know, back-to-back -back meetings at this level on this important topic, I must commend um, the leadership of JHDA to have driven this in the direction that we're going. And so again, I'm very, very happy to be a part of this um, organization on, on that basis. So thanks, Robin. Um, and, and of course, you know, um, Camille is not here. She had to be off, to the, off this afternoon. But I also want to thank Camille as well, who has really been, at the, again, at the poor forefront of getting the message out to the members that this is something not to be played with. I mean, we saw, I was a part of some of those conversations as far back as 2016. Uh, um, we're in cybersecurity as well. And we know that the bad actors are looking for opportunities to, to make claims. When I sp spoke to the OIC myself, 
there, they've said to us that claims have started to come in. So there are persons who are looking for the weak fences. They're looking for opportunities to, to profit and to benefit from the inaction of, 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 of companies. And so I think something like this, an, an opportunity like this where we have someone at the caliber of, of, of Chris is just amazing. And I think, um, again, let me just move over now to Chris. I really want to thank you so much, um, Chris. I mean, I, when I reached out um, on behalf of the JHDA, I mean, we, we had a conversation, myself, Chris, Christopher Jarrett, who is a co-chair, and um, Camille Needham, who is the ED. Um, Your name came up, Christopher, as one of the persons. An immediate yes, I will. I'm willing to do it at this point in time. Um, but you said yes, and I think everybody on the call would agree that I mean that's been really a very rewarding um, afternoon to go through such important information. And so I want to thank you so much, Christopher, um, for for being available and for being so open and for being so clear. The clarity of what you brought forward has been um, tremendous. And so without further ado, let me just thank everyone. Um, thanks to our moderator, um, Suzanne, for handling things for us, being the host today. Um, thanks everyone for, for taking time out to be a part of this event. If you've not done so, um, you can share your email with the moderator if you want to, to, to get copies of anything that we're gonna be distributing. Um, that's your choice. If not, that's fine. Um, for those persons who want to sort of get any information there, you know, after this, we can share it with you as, as, um, as, as it comes in from Chris or, or otherwise. Um, but then, you know, let me let me um, wish everyone happy Christmas, happy holidays. I know it's we're jumping right into the into the crazy times in the next couple of days. So let me just um, hope that everyone keep safe, keep well, keep happy. Um, and of course, looking forward to jumping on next year for, for bigger and better things for everyone. And so thanks again. Thanks everyone. So before you before you disappear, before you disappear, um, folks, I know one or two people start jumping off already. But yeah. we are in the midst of a tremendous amount of cybersecurity issues right now. We've seen what happened with Petrojam this week. And there's and these are the ones that are reported, by the way, because there's a fair amount happened that are not reported. So I'm just kind of using the opportunity to just remind everybody that cybersecurity is a critical, critical, critical situation. And it's a component of it. It is the data protection part of this, all right? So I'm just kind of reminding everybody to check with your organizations as to the level of um, uh, protection that is in place. Get a feel as to the risk tolerance of the organization. If you have not done so before, do some sort of an assessment, whether it's a pen test or volumetric assessment, please, because things are about to get jiggy right now. Yeah, I, 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 I endorse that and I agree. I've seen a few things myself in my quarters. So you're right, um, Christopher. Things are getting a little bit hectic on the, on the cyber side. So this is very timely. And again, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. And um, all the best um, until we meet again in our next JHTA meeting um, next year, I believe. Thanks, everyone. All the best. All right, folks. Bye. Thank you. Yeah.